Hello, good evening, and welcome to the next in our two-part series examining diplomacy in Total War Three Kingdoms. Three Kingdoms marks the most extensive rewrite of Total War's diplomacy system to date. And in the last video, we covered deal-making, haggling, saber-rattling, and more. Today, we'll be dealing with the different forms of alliance and how they can help you to broker major blocks of power across the campaign map. There are now two key forms of alliance, coalitions and military alliances. Each offers different levels of choice, commitment and control, and they also share some important features. Both forms can have multiple members, enabling you to build large power blocks for mutual benefit. And simply by being in a coalition or alliance with other warlords, your diplomatic standing with the other members increases. Coalitions and military alliances also benefit the mobility of your armies. Here we're in the early phases of a campaign playing as Yuran Shao, who's currently besieging a town owned by the Han Empire. As he's in enemy territory, we can see he's getting a major negative to his army's military supplies each turn. Meanwhile, his eldest son Yuan Tan is holding the front at home, and instead gathering supplies each turn. Coalitions and military alliances give you new tracts of friendly territory in which to rest, replenish and resupply before striking out into enemy lands once more. So let's break down the two forms of alliance. A coalition is a looser, lower commitment sort of arrangement than a military alliance. Forming a coalition is relatively easy as long as you have a neutral or better diplomatic standing with the other party. Being at war with a mutual enemy is also a definite bonus of course. Let's see if we can get a coalition signed with Liu Bei. He names his price, which we can well afford, and yes, the pact is signed. Now, if we arrange the diplomatic faction list by group, we can see we're now part of the newly formed Thundering Sky Coalition. Once a coalition is signed, any member can invite another warlord to join. But like many major actions that a warlord wishes to perform in a coalition, the consent of all parties is required. So if we go on to invite a new warlord to the coalition, for example, the action will be voted on by the other members and the majority rules. So if we propose inviting Cao Cao to the coalition, for example, we can see Liu Bei looks well upon this. Diplomatic standing plays a strong role in voting, of course, so the higher your standing with other members, the more likely it'll be that they'll vote in favour of any coalition action you declare. Now that we're in a coalition, we gain visibility over our fellow members' lands, where our armies can, of course, now resupply on their travels. In addition, you can only switch characters and their retinues out of armies in friendly territory, and allied territory counts as this. Being in a coalition also means you're strengthening ties with increasingly friendly factions that might join you in your wars, but that is not a given. This early in the game, for example, with relatively small holdings and wars of their own to contend with, our coalition pals may not be so inclined to join in. As a loose arrangement, there's no formal obligation for coalition members to join each other's wars. So as we declare war on Yuan Shu, we see there's no vote required. We can then of course go cap in hand to our coalition members afterwards and seek their individual support in such a war. But their military support will still need some negotiation, especially if a coalition member is friendly towards the warlord you've just declared war on. In short, you can merrily engage in private wars without involving the entire coalition. Coalitions are easy to arrange and easy to leave too, but the benefits to maintaining a coalition are clear. Not least that the longer you're in a coalition, the better your diplomatic standing with certain factions becomes. If a faction joins and it turns out to be a thorn in your side, you can call a vote to kick them out, enabling you to manage membership, provided the other members agree. Jumping into a later save now, let's take a look at military alliances. Now, these are a higher commitment form of alliance, and warlords will need to be at the faction rank of Marquis to sign one, though this is not required to join an existing alliance. You can also transition a coalition into a military alliance on the strength of a vote, and again the warlord who proposes this must be a Marquis or better. Yuan Shao's current coalition sees him in league with Liu Biao and his vassals, plus Wang Kuang and Cao Cao. Cao Cao and Liu Biao are all for it, but Wang Kuang isn't, meaning three in favour and one against. So Wang Kuang leaves the party and we form a military alliance with Cao Cao and Liu Biao. The key differences between coalitions and military alliances revolve around the notion of shared defence. 
As soon as a military alliance is signed, you become part of a defensive pact. If war is declared against a member of an alliance, that member may choose to fight the aggressor in the private war or call their allies to arms. All members of the alliance are duty bound to uphold this and will then enter the war. You can also declare an alliance war against a third party, which of course goes to an immediate vote with the members. If the majority vote yes, the alliance will go to war with the target faction. There are only two ways to resolve an alliance war. Either you leave the alliance and sign peace with the opposing belligerents on your own terms, or the alliance votes as a group and once again a majority vote is needed on both sides to bring peace. Any minorities opposing peace will leave the alliance and continue in private wars against the original targets. Neither coalitions or alliances stop you from engaging in private wars, of course. You can still declare war or sign peace with other individual factions at your leisure. Now, all of this adds up to a system where, over the course of a campaign, you'll see coalitions form over time as different warlords' goals and situations align. The AI understands the value of such arrangements and will engage in them frequently. Some coalitions will be fleeting and will fall apart as goals diverge. Some will endure to become distinct power blocks and some will solidify into powerful military alliances that the world begins to revolve around. Indeed, wars between significant long-term alliances become more common as the campaign reaches its later stages. Another classic diplomacy feature also makes its return in Three Kingdoms, and that's region trading. Alongside food, money, ancillaries, and numerous other diplomatic treaties, territory can now be used as a bargaining tool in diplomacy, and it's about the most valuable commodity going. It's a useful way of garnering major value to strike big deals, especially later in the campaign where you may have a surfeit of territory. If we approached Tsao and click the Trade Territory option, all our owned regions are shown, listed by Commandery, with their constituent regions detailed below. You can only trade away regions which are adjacent to the territory of the warlord you're dealing with. So if we were to offer territory to Tsao we can see that only Yingxuan Commandery is tradable, as it's the only one next to his lands. As you can see, productive farmland is very desirable, so we can demand a lot in return. In this case, let's try 4 food per turn for 10 turns and a regular payment of 500 gold per turn. But a big ticket item like a tract of farmland can be useful in deals where the warlord's asking price may be high. In aggregate, these many changes to diplomacy enable you to achieve more than ever before. With a host of new big ticket assets to trade and with the ability to forge mighty alliances between powerful warlords, the campaign power play in Total War Three Kingdoms is at once more subtle more complex and more far-reaching than ever before. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more Three Kingdoms gameplay coming very soon.